are joined by President Natalie Shirley to welcome you to this amazing museum, but more importantly, the exhibit we are about to explore. You are going to be so excited. I want to welcome you personally to Spyro and the Art of the Mississippian People. What you may not realize is that America may have been quote unquote discovered um, in 1492, but the reality is, is that there were people here millions of people here and in fact there were civilizations that were very very advanced and so Spyro and the art of the Mississippian world is going to introduce you to people that were here in 800 AD. Thank you so much for being here with us today. You're welcome. My name is Eric Singleton. I'm the Curator of Ethnology at the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum. When you hear the term Spyro and think of the ancient Mississippian world, based on your research, your expertise, and even your imagination, what comes to your mind? Well, when I think about Spyro, growing up in Oklahoma and actually doing research and work on this site, I think of one of the most unique sites ever found in North America. And Spyro truly is the definition of unique in that nothing else like Spyro has ever been found in all of North or Central America. And when it comes to this wonderful civilization, this community that was so vast that it was unlike anything we have ever seen before in North America up till that time, when and where does the story of this culture and society begin. Well, the, the history of the society, which we call the Mississippians, and we call them the Mississippians because they were really uh, some of the first mounds and groups and, and cities we found were around the Mississippi River or the Mississippi River Valley. Um, and then Spyro is just one city amongst an entire uh, group of people. And so, you know, we kind of look at it like Europe, you know, this would have been France as opposed to Germany and, and you know so each of these major cities actually has their own um, community and political structure but uniting them all is this unity of belief and ideal ideology and iconography and that's really what we're seeing here and what makes Spyro so unique is that 90 percent of all engraved Mississippian shell is found at this single site and so it, it's pretty incredible When it comes to studying ancient cultures, peoples, and civilizations, material culture plays a critical role in understanding the people and their world. And so my question is, based on the artifacts that we are going to see here today, what story does it tell us about their world? Well, you see the highly skilled uh, craftsmanship of uh, pre-Columbian North Americans. And so that's pretty amazing because many of the objects that you actually see here today would have been revered in, I would say, any community anywhere in the world. And so what makes this exhibit so um, fascinating to me is this is America's classic culture. Yet when you think that the majority of indigenous people are are pigeonholed into a John Wayne narrative. It's really unfair because the vast majority of indigenous people were these amazing craftsmen and amazing people who created large cities that at the time and at their height were larger than London and Paris. And so, uh, you know, another aspect of this is that you're looking at a continent that's virtually um, a paradise. Uh, there is no disease. The uh, 
corns, beans, and squash creates a perfect amino acid. The tomato came from the Americas. The potato. I mean, what's Italian food without the tomato? So, you know, it's like what so many things we take for granted today actually were harvested and cultivated by indigenous people. And they really shaped the entire world. And so really seeing them for who they are and for what they built and the height of their culture and community is, is just truly satisfying and rewarding. An article by the National Geographic stated that the Spyro were once the single most powerful group to ever exist in North America. Would it be fair to call them an empire? Or is it more complicated than that? It's way more complicated than that. Uh, in fact, I think what you're really looking at is Spyro was the seat of a ritual center. And so I don't think that you would look at it in terms of empire because that's not the same thing. You know, you always, we always kind of uh, put things in context of what we understand in a historical narrative that's been dictated by Europe and Asia. But the reality is, is America has this vast, amazing history that is unique unto itself. And so what you're really looking at is a system of cultural exchange where objects came to Spyro because I believe it was a it was part of sacred geography. It was a ritual center that had a power and meaning to everyone. Uh, but it, So it wasn't part of an empire. It was a ritual center that had uh, purpose and value to everyone across the eastern half of North America. As we just left off, you talk about cultural exchange. And that is what I want to talk about now. How extensive was this trade network Ah, that's a great question. The, the trading networks that we see here extend halfway across North America. And I, by saying North America, I'm using it in its truest form. We're talking about Mexico and Canada. You know, borders that we see today just don't exist. And so you're looking at obsidian from the Valley of Mexico. You're looking at beads from the Sea of Cortez. Copper's coming in from the Great Lakes. Uh, engraved uh, lightning walk is coming from the Florida Keys. On all the objects you see in this exhibition, I put distance traveled to reach Spyro. And the, the furthest destination is 1,400 miles away. And that is traversed by canoe or by walking. And so the, the way we understand distance today is just, it's, it's incomprehensible, I think, to many people. So that tells you how sacred and powerful and important these objects were, and that they came literally from half a continent away to arrive at this single location. We often associate power, whether religious or political, with violence. And we had talked earlier that this was almost a paradise of sorts. And so I wanted to ask, was there violence in the ancient Mississippian world and within the cultures that were a part of it? Oh yeah, you know, I mean, humanity just is violent. You know, there is this kind of, this myth that it is a, 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 an Eden-like paradise, and you could say that it is from a landscape point of view, you know, and uh, a dietary point of view, but warfare is happening everywhere. I mean, nations are at war with each other all the time. That's just human nature. Um, many of the communities we know today, the Osage, the Cheyenne, the Caddo, Violence is just a part of that, you know, that's just human nature. So, and you see that reflected in the artwork, you know, so it's really important to keep in mind that these are just people like any other, but what they did was create an amazing community that was utter unique and utterly unique in the world uh, and with these exquisite works of art. And art, I say that because we simply don't have another word for it. These had an active role in society. They are works of art because they were highly skilled, well-crafted, and your average person can't do it. But unlike European art and Asian art per se, you know, on the whole, they played an active role in society, not just a passive role. And so they take on a totally different meaning, and they have a depth that's really uh, very unique. I'd like to talk about Spyro itself. What makes it so unique? 
So Spyro is so unique because it is the most object-laden mount ever found in North America. And the crux of this exhibition is something that's been in my mind for years, I mean, a decade, if not longer, is why? Why was Spyro so unique? I mean, we're not talking about the largest city. And, and you know, we're not talking about the biggest population or otherwise. So why? Why would this occur? And what it... Uh, started kind of asking, well, we looked at all the different cities across North America, and we realized that at 1400, they're all starting to collapse. And you start thinking, well, what would cause an entire continent to collapse? And outside of invasion or an army, which is not occurring, environment. And so you look at the environment. So we started doing soil sampling, and we realized that in 1350, a mini ice age began in North America, and it lasted until 1650. Now, if you have a large population base, they need a lot of crops to survive. Now, if you're having extended periods of drought, it doesn't work. And so what you see at Spyro is all of these objects came and they were put into a single hollow chamber. And what we call the, uh, a spirit lodge, for lack of a better word, and it looks like a Pawnee Earth Lodge. And yet inside of this, you have large statuary of morning star, evening star, 18 different baskets um, with different outfits, 100 engraved shell cups, 800 unengraved cups, crystal, uh, ceremonial weaponry. And the question is why? And the point of this was to restart time. They were performing a ritual which mimicked creation. They knew how the world was made and they were actually recreating the actions which started the world. And so that's what makes Spyro so unique. When I think of religion and the fundamental landmarks of these religions that occupy our world today and throughout history, many times I think of Mecca, the holy place of medieval Islam. I think of the city of Rome at the very heart of Christianity. I want to redirect that focus to the Americas, to North America. We have all of these amazing artifacts coming to one place, and I want to talk about Spyro itself. This sacred and ritualistic site that became the home of artifacts from across the Americas. Do we know anything about their religion and their religious practices? Yeah, you know, a lot of what we actually understand today comes from oral traditions, uh, working with elders and tribal communities, and uh, looking at the folklore, and then comparing that to the ancient cultures. Um, and so what you're looking at is a, um, is a belief in a tri-layered universe with an above, a middle, and a below world. And it appears that everyone in North and Central America, and even South America, believes in this same concept. And so it's been really um, kind of uh, advantageous to have uh, a belief structure that actually is in, the, in North and Central America. So occasionally when you are trying to understand this material, you can refer back to uh, other communities and the way that they actually ritualistically performed an action. And so it's been really uh, helpful to understand that you have this common ideology. As we approach the Spyro and their almost forgotten realm that was the ancient Mississippian world, I have to ask, what happened to them? And will we ever know? Yes, and that's the amazing thing. If you want to know who a Mississippian is, ask the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, the Caddo, the Wichita, all the communities that we know today, and the, the Shawnee, everyone, uh, the Osage, uh, the Potawatomi, they're Mississippians. They never left. And so, you know, we have these conversations between past and present, you know, like pre-European, post-European. Well, you know, that's just a way for us to kind of isolate time periods. But the truth is, they never left. So the Mississippians, I think, declined based off environment. And they moved out into these uh, village structures. They just, they reformed in a different community, a different community structure. But they didn't go anywhere. The Seminole people are Mississippians, the Muscogee and Cherokee. So 
the Mississippians are still with us today and a, and a wonderful part of our community. And that's really, I think, the most rewarding part of this exhibition is working with tribal artists and communities from 12 different nations and incorporating contemporary artwork into the space. And so you get to see the ancient material side by side with the contemporary and see cultural continuation in the evolution of not only art forms, but people. And so the people who built this, this, uh, these communities are still with us today. we included these debris and these are the original debris from 1591 is this is the closest physical descriptions we have of the Mississippian people These are long nosed maskettes, which would have been associated with the headdress, and they would have dropped down to the ears. And you can see there's two holes on either side. Those have to, that's how they would have attached to the headdress and pushed out. And um, it's likely that they represent the hero twins, Thunder and Lightning, which again is a myth that goes into Central America, uh, including the Maya referenced in the Maya Popol Vuh, as well as being incorporated here in North America. Now, a lot of the pieces you see here, too, are uh, pictographic in nature. So, uh, for example, this gorget right here uh, shows a map of the universe, because earlier we talked about a tri-layered universe with an above, middle, and a below world. Now, we say below, but the reality is that's actually the night sky, and it moves. So we say below, for lack of a better word, and so people get an understanding that indigenous people understood it for what it was. Um, and this shows that because the entrance to the underworld is through whirlpools and caves. So you get a swirl pattern in the center, which represents the whirlpool, a double line, which represents a dance circle, then the six dots with a bunch of little dots behind it is the constellation Pleiades, and the tufts behind it actually are the underfeathers of Birdman who lives in the above world. So you're looking at a map of the cosmos. And this room was just designed to give people context for Spyro. So most people don't know who Spyro is, most people don't know what the Mississippians were. So this whole room was just to give you context before you walk into the next space. And so we highlighted five of your principal sites, then you know pieces from each of those sites. A lot of these sites, they're imbued with power, but there's a depth to each of them. There's purpose. So for example, that uh, piece right over here, you can see the swirl pattern right there. That represents a moth proboscis, or a tongue, that's uh, associated with the sphinx moth. And the Sphinx moth feeds on Datura, which is a, a very powerful hallucinogen. And when these vessels were tested, they tested positive for Datura. So they're telling you what's in it by showing you that proboscis. And when it comes to the human form in their art, do we know what we are seeing here with these two figurines? Honestly, I wish I knew. Uh, there's some talk that maybe they were male, female, associated with deities, Earth Mother. Um, you know, there's a lot that's just been lost, to be perfectly honest. And that's really what we're trying to do, is trying to reclaim a lot of these history and heritage and traditions. Uh, now, a lot is known, but so much was lost. As Europeans moved west, what they did was just basically barrel over all these communities and all their history, and so, so many mounds. I mean, St. Louis is built under Cahokia, which had 220 mounds. And so by doing that, you've lost so much history. And so 
there are aspects of this that is just um, is presently not known, but there's a lot that is. So, uh, but that's like all cultures, you know. If someone goes back and tries, you know, I mean, there's a direct line between ancient Rome and today. They're even writing about it, but they're still doing archaeology because there's so much they don't know. And in fact, until about five or six years ago, they thought ancient Greek and Roman statue was white. The reality is, it's all painted. How did you forget that? But you did. So that's just kind of life. Are those jagged lines supposed to represent a river? The reason I ask is because in Europe, during the establishment of what's becoming the Bronze Age, we see very similar designs appear that many believe represent a river. And I have to say, I'm fascinated to see a similar style pop up here in the Americas. That's a great question, and very well may be. I don't know the answer to that. Sometimes the stuff is associated with dances. Sometimes it could be a river. There's a lot of abstract. Um, I'm sure someone does know. I see it all the time. It's heavily utilized, but I'm not sure. It's very focused on just Caddo. It's a good suggestion, and it very well may be the case. You know, and that really speaks to just um, who humans are. You know, people have always asked, well, how come they're building pyramids over here? Well, to be perfectly honest, the pyramids are the easiest thing in the world to build. It's just inherent in human nature to build in a certain way. Watch a kid. They're going to build a pyramid. Um, but there's the example of the Pleiades. Well, that motif is on the Nebra sky disk, which was uh, from 1600 BC, the exact same motif. So a lot of this is worldwide. Um, I would even argue, uh, but there's a lot to go into, is, uh, is kind of tracing back the roots of some of Joseph Campbell's work, which is the origins of myth and ritual and how it has the potential to go back to a single source. And then what you're looking at is just the evolution of an idea worldwide. Because so much of the narratives that we look at are so common. Uh, and in fact, we look at this as multiple deities here in North America, but the reality is, there is a God above them all, and this God is unknowable. Uh, there is no describing this, this, this God. It's just God. It's almost the exact kind of way that uh, the Islamic faith describes God. You can't draw it because it's unknowable. It even goes back to Akhenaten and the first what they would call monotheist, um, which is really describing you know, God as unknowable, undrawable, because it's incomprehensible. And actually, I was just talking this morning about this from a physics point of view, how much maybe science and religion actually does come together if they were actually willing to just think about it. Because like how many people can actually conceptualize the Big Bang or the enormity of the universe? Or please explain to me, if nothing was around before the Big Bang, then how did all matter occur from it? Well, those are questions that I think bridge science and religion because they're just concepts that just, they're so vast, I just think they're incomprehensible. So I think Europeans are the most unique people in the world. And I think the reason Europeans are so unique is it came out of the Renaissance and a pushback against the church. And what they did was they started coming up with fact-based methodology. So that's where you see the rise of the physical sciences and proofs. So you actually had to be able to prove in order to assert a fact, the scientific method. And so it was a pushback against religion, but what it also did was it, it compartmentalized stuff. And so the disadvantage is that when we start thinking in those terms, it, there's this concept that North America is different, but it evolved at the exact same time. So this timeline here actually shows the entire Mississippian period on a world stage. So when the Mississippians are actually beginning, algebra is created in Baghdad. Um, when Cahokia is founded, that large ceremonial center that's underneath St. Louis, uh, William the Conqueror is invading England. Uh, when the Mississippians are at their height, when Spyro is at its height, Genghis Khan is moving through China. Um, 1400, when the ritual that occurred at Spyro was happening, well, Joan of Arc was being burned at the stake in Europe. And the one that really got me, and I've studied this a long time, was Harvard was founded in 1636, and the last Mississippian kingdom fell in 1650. So looking at everything on a world stage, I guess it provides it such firmer context. 
and shows how much diversity is wonderful, you know, I mean, because you're starting to actually look at everyone in, in relation to each other as we all grow, you know, so it's actually just like looking at a friend down the block is maybe how you should be looking at the evolution of society. You're all growing at the same time, but you are two different people, but you grow together. And so that's kind of by putting this together on the world stage, I thought it actually um, placed North America and the Americas on, on the proper pedestal that it's deserved. I mean, that's so brilliant because really when you think about it, it's so typical for people to separate histories and only look yep. at one. When it would be, the reality is with awesome tools like this, we get to see the entire world evolve at the same time. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing. That is exactly. Amazing. So this is Morning Star, Evening Star. See the necklace he's wearing right there? It's right there in that case. The ear spools he's wearing right there, those are in that first case you walk in. They're not the long nose, but he's the same guy. But there's two shell in the next case over by the film that he's wearing those ear spools in his ears. So everything you see here was really made too. <laughs> and so this is copper that came from the Great Lakes. I mean, perfectly in size. Um, giant, these are pipes, represent certain deities ear spools. These are the ceremonial weapons you can see made out of stone. And what's really cool about these too is these objects here were made um, or are, are shown in Mississippian gorgets. So you see the hero twins and mythic characters actually holding these and utilizing them in the mythology, which is the battle of the giants or, you know, uh, well, one of the hero twins lost one of their heads. So these are the actual weapons that were used by the gods. And so that's pretty incredible. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, seriously. And you can see that it's still being done today. So this mace right here is done by Caddo artist Wayne Earls. That's a thousand years old, and that was done last year. So you could see this cultural continuation. So getting back to who are the Mississippians, they're sitting right there. Yeah, the other side. And so what you're looking at here are um, additional ceremonial monolithic axes. And so these two represent garfish. You know, maybe alligator, alligator gar, but these are fish. And so, um, again, held in the hand. Probably used ritualistically, not in person, uh, because you know they would have shattered after a couple blows. But uh, but it speaks to the, the craftsmanship. These are made out of stone. So if you think about what it took to actually carve this a thousand years ago, it's pretty breathtaking. And the fact of what it represents. See, I look at that. I see an axe. But from your expertise, your research, you see so much more. Yeah. And I mean, that's a that's amazing. Yeah, and you can see the subtlety, you know, to create the teeth, the eyes in there. It's a fish. So what you're looking at here is, in this show, we included contemporary artwork as well as the ancient. And so the hollow chamber that was found at Spyro was in all likelihood lined with textiles. And it's really a shame that these looters got in here and destroyed most of this because it really added a color and depth to the, to the, to the culture that is just kind of unknown today. Um, and so uh, Chickasaw art artist Margaret Roach Wheeler actually did a fellowship at uh, the National Museum of the American Indian and studied ancient textiles and then came home and wove this in the fashion of the ancient Spiro and textiles. And this gives you a small idea of what the people actually would have dressed and looked like. Um, and this actually shows supernatural characters on the back of it, fully woven. And what we saw when we looked at these ancient textiles is they did the same thing. So you would have had a giant bird or a bird man or OG symbols, portal elements, all embedded into the ancient textiles. And so this was a really important piece to have in the show because it really highlights uh, the depth of not only craft, but uh, the color and, and just kind of the enormity of the outfits that were worn by the Mississippians. And I mean, once again, with an emphasis on the spiritual nature of those peoples as well. I mean, oh yeah. It's fantastic. And so yeah, you get a similar design or another design that's woven in based off different uh, textile colors. 
So what's important to remember here in North America is that religion and reality are the same thing. You can't separate them. You know, way too often, I think, and well, in certain religious elements, you know, whether it's Christian or other elements, there's you go to church, but then you kind of walk out the door and you start your life. I don't think sometimes people look at everything as, you know, that's an understatement because I know Christians do, but literally everything, religion, reality, outfits, everything you do is based off the supernatural and, and the metaphysical realm. And so there's, I, I just say it from a point of view that there is a depth that everyone takes into consideration um, with actions, locations, sacred geography, connections to the environment. Um, and so it, it all plays a role. It's all connected, the environment, animals, uh, animals who are chimeras, animals who are um, you know, tricksters and changelings, like everything is, is, is represented in the belief structure and the real world. And when it comes to this amazing pottery, what does it tell us? What story is being told here? What's really cool about this, this is an engraved shell cup that comes from the Florida Keys. And so we call these medicine cups and inside these were likely stored black drink or a hallucinogenic element um, that would have been part of a ritual. But inscribed in each of these is a different scene. And so what we started figuring out was when a lot of these scenes are set side by side by side, they're chapters within a book. So you're looking at a pictographic narrative of likely the universe and mythology. And so this is a book, and this is how it should be viewed. And each of these tells a story. So this is a, a modern reproduction of this gorge, or this shell that you see right next to you. Uh, and I think what you're looking at is, for, I've called him the Lord of the Pleiades, because in the background is, in all likelihood, the constellation the Pleiades. And it was a portal element that allowed people to venture in and out of the supernatural realm. And this guy was standing in front of this, either guarding it or protecting it. And so that's part of a mythic narrative. And so each of these cups actually is part of that larger narrative. Here is four underwater serpents uh, circled by a cross. I think this harkens back to the narrative of the balancing of the world. So the world is a tri-layered universe which sits on a primordial sea on the back of a turtle. Well, in initially that turtle began to sway in the ocean. So the underwater serpents went down and they held, they hold up the world on the four cardinal directions. And that's part of the mythology. And lo and behold, you see it right there. And this is a perfect example of how oral traditions, folkloric narratives that are historic and even uh, contemporary today are matched against ancient material. And that's how we know what we know, is by studying these oral traditions and folklores. Uh, all of a sudden you see that narrative come to life in this ancient material and you have a sense of what you're looking at.